In all of Tolkien's many, many writings, there is no elf quite like Luthien. Maya Gavan and Melanine, Amenek Swilaid, my name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to this second video in our series totally untangling the tale of Beren and Luthien. In the last video, I focused on Beren, and so in this video, I am going to talk all about the elf maiden Luthien Tinuviel. Now, Luthien is a character that I've not really mentioned before in any previous First Age playlist, and that's because her story is so self-contained that she's just really not been relevant until now. But that's not to say that she didn't exist until now. Luthien is an old elf. Like, she's been around in Beleriand for a very long time, and on the day that she meets Beren, she is already 3,338 years old. That makes her older than Finarfin, the father of Galadriel and Finrod Felagund. She is also older than the entire city of Menegroth, where she lives, and she was even living in Beleriand before any dwarves settled in that region. She is older than the Silmarils and the Palantiri and even the Tengwa written language. She is considerably older than the Sun. So, although she is barely mentioned in the Silmarillion before Chapter 19, which is called Of Beren and Luthien, we can perhaps speculate that she may have been present as like a background figure during some of the major events involving her parents. When Melian the Maya repelled the coming of Ungoliant and drove her away from Doriath, perhaps Luthien was there, helping her mother. When Eluthingol united with the dwarves and built Menegroth, perhaps she was there too, helping with the decorating. We just don't know, but there aren't any explicit details to prevent us from speculating. However, while I am on the topic of Luthien's parents, I do want to take a little bit of time for a brief recap of who these two characters are. Luthien is of course the only child of Eluthingol, the Grey King of Doriath and the High King of the Sindar, and his angelic wife, Melian the Maya. And I have talked about Thingol and Melian in quite a few videos before, perhaps most fully in this video, but they both have very long stories that go back pretty much to the beginning. And in Melian's case, I mean like the literal beginning. The number one most important thing to know about Melian is that although she's married to a great high elven king and she rules an elven kingdom, Melian is absolutely not an elf. She is a Maya. When I described her as angelic, I meant that quite literally. The Maya are effectively like the angels and demigods of Tolkien's legendarium. Sauron is a Maya, the Balrogs are Maya, and Melian is a Maya. She was created in the Timeless Halls by Iluvatar himself. She is older than the universe, let alone the planet, and she has incredible power in Middle-earth. Which of course means Luthien is not wholly an elf either. She is Middle-earth's only confirmed half Maya. And I guess the next closest thing would be the character of Shelob. And so even among the fairest and wisest and mightiest of all elves, Luthien stands in a league of her own. Anyway, Luthien's father is also a very important and very powerful character, and although he's nowhere near as old as his wife, he is still a pretty ancient elf. Thingol was either born all the way back in Cuivienen, at the very place where the first elves ever awoke, or he wasn't born, because he was one of those very first elves ever to awake. We aren't explicitly told either way, and Thingol does have two brothers, which makes me think he wasn't among the very first generation to awake, but then again, many of the Valar have siblings, and yet we know none of them were born, so he very well could have been one of the first elves. Either way, if Thingol didn't belong to the very first generation, he was at least one of their children or grandchildren. But back then, in Cuivienen, before any elves had encountered the Valar and begun their long migration into the west, Thingol went by another name. He was Elwë, 
and Elwë was the high king of the Teleri, the largest of the three elven clans. And the reason that Elwë was such a big deal back in the beginning is that he was one of the three elven ambassadors chosen by the Valar Orome to represent his people and to journey into the uttermost west to behold the light of Valinor. This he did along with his close friend Finwë, that's the high king of the Noldor, and one day the father of Feanor and Fingolfin. Upon Elwë's return to Quivienen, he convinced many of his Teleryn people to join him on the migration west to cross the sea and to live with the Valar. However, during this migration across the entire width of Middle-earth, everything changed for Elwë. While passing through East Beleriand on his way to the coast, Elwë was drawn away from his people and he wandered alone into the starlit forest of Nan Elmoth. And there he first encountered Melian the Maya. I think it's another one of those cases where Tolkien uses the word chance, but what he means is fate, or specifically the will of Iluvatar. Because the meeting of Thingol and Melian feels a lot more supernatural than pretty much any other meet cute in the entire legendarium. First, Elwë hears the song of nightingales, and an enchantment immediately falls on him. And remember Nightingales, because they are an important part of Luthien's characterization. But then Elwë hears the voice of Melian, and his heart is filled with wonder and desire. He forgets utterly all his people and all the purposes of his mind, and he follows the Nightingales to the glade where Melian is waiting. Beneath the light of the stars, they stare at each other in silence, and when Elwë takes Melian's hand, straight away a spell was laid on him, and they stood together in silence for years and years and years. Stars wheeled overhead, and remember there's no sun at this point, so it's always night, and by the time Elwë and Melian finally do leave this glade where they met, tall trees have grown up around them. Many of the Teleri have moved on into the west, but many also have stayed and settled in Beleriand, awaiting the return of their king. And so, these elves of Elwë, who call themselves the Sindar, are Dark Elves, or Mora Quendi, because they never did behold the light of Valinor. But don't forget, Elwë totally did. He was one of the three ambassadors who went ahead of his people, and so Elwë is the only High Elf, the only Calaquendi, in a world full of Dark Elves. From then on, Elwë became known as Eluthingol, which means King Greymantle, and he's also the tallest elf ever to live. The sole child of his union with Melian, and thus to an extent the whole reason that Iluvatar willed their union into being, is Luthien. And there are quite a few interesting parallels between Melian's union with Thingol and Luthien's union with Beren. The most obvious right now being that Thingol is the first elf ever to marry a non-elf, and his daughter Luthien is the second. But anyway, both Melian and Eluthingol do quite a few very important things in the early First Age before Luthien ever encounters Beren, and I talk about them in a lot of detail in my Lords of Beleriand playlist, specifically the first four videos of that playlist, so check them out to learn more. But there is one story starring Thingol that is only mentioned in the older Lay of Lathian, but it doesn't contradict anything that's written in the Silmarillion, and it's really quite cool. Although, as I say, if having a single coherent canon is incredibly important to you, then maybe do take this story with a pinch of salt. You see, in the Lay of Lathian, we are told that all the way in Angband, Morgoth had heard rumours of the beauty and the loveliness of Luthien. And so, because Morgoth is the worst person ever, he summoned a great army and he sent them towards Doriath, partly to take down a mighty rival, but also partly to kidnap Luthien and to bring her to Angband for what Tolkien calls undisclosed reasons. Anyway, this attack was obviously unsuccessful, as neither Luthien nor Doriath were ever captured by Morgoth, but what's very cool about this is that in the Lay, Tolkien names the orc that commanded Morgoth's army in this battle, and the name of that orc is Bulldog. 
Now, in this video, I talk all about bulldogs and how by the end of his life, Tolkien probably intended bulldogs to be a type of orc-formed Maya, sort of like Balrogs, but a little bit less mighty. And of course, we have no idea if Tolkien intended this bulldog to be a Maya in orc form, or just a regular orc whose name was Bulldog, but what we do know is that in this battle, Thingol cut off Bulldog's head with his sword Aranruth, which literally means the king's anger. So, although it's not strictly canon, if such things can ever exist in Tolkien's writings, there certainly is room to speculate on Thingol dueling an evil Maya near the north marches of Doriath and killing him in single combat. Anyway, there's just one more thing that I want to speculate on before we get back to Tolkien's actual explicit writings on how Beren met Luthien, and that thing to speculate on is the role of Galadriel in all of this. So, as I mentioned in the Lords of Beleriand playlist hundreds of years before Beren came to Doriath, Galadriel came, and she settled in Menegroth and fell in love with Celeborn. But it seems she also developed a bit of a, like a mentor-mentee relationship with Melian. It appears that pretty much everything Galadriel was by the Third Age was taught to her by Melian in the First Age. And so, is it possible that while Galadriel was studying under the tutelage of Melian, she and Luthien developed a sort of friendship? Was Luthien like a bit of an older sister to Galadriel? Obviously, we don't know, and we do know that Tolkien definitely did not intend this from the beginning. Luthien first entered Tolkien's writings in 1917 with the tale of Tinuviel, but Galadriel did not appear until the 1950s, when Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings. However, the Silmarillion is in many ways a coming together of Tolkien's life work, and it was published after he died, and by then, both Galadriel and Luthien were living together in Menegroth at the same time, and they both looked up to Melian. But anyway, back to the Silmarillion, we have now caught up with the end of the last video, and so it's time to talk about that first moment when Beren and Luthien met. As I've already explained, Beren was in a very bad way at this moment in time, and he was sort of stumbling blindly through the woods after surviving an indescribably harrowing journey over the mountains of terror and through the valley of dreadful death. And then he encounters Luthien, singing and dancing in a hemlock glade of the very same wood that she was born in. And Beren's reaction to this is very similar to Thingol's reaction upon first meeting Melian. We're told that all memory of Beren's pain departed him when he looked upon Luthien, and he fell into an enchantment. That's almost the exact same words Tolkien used to describe Thingol, by the way. And Beren immediately fell in love with Luthien, which is fair enough, really, considering the description that Tolkien gives of Luthien in this very scene. We are told that as the light upon the leaves of trees, as the voice of clear waters, as the stars above the mists of the world, such was her glory and her loveliness, and in her face was a shining light. Now, I don't want to go too far down a literary rabbit hole here, but I think this description of Luthien, along with a few other details given a little later, all share a theme that is really central to Luthien's character. When Beren first hears her sing, he has no idea who she is or what her name is, so he calls her Tinuviel which means Nightingale, or literally Daughter of Twilight. I told you Nightingales were going to come back in a big way. And Luthien's song is compared to a Nightingale's quite a few times in the story, just as her mother's was, and just as her great-great-granddaughter Arwen's will one day be. But a Nightingale is not the only bird that Luthien's singing is compared to on this very page. In fact, in the very next paragraph, her voice is compared to a lark's. And a lark isn't just another example of a songbird, it is, I guess, the literary opposite of a Nightingale. Nightingales sing at night, larks sing with the dawn. And there's another example of this two paragraphs earlier. 
Luthien's raiment, that's her clothes, are described as blue as the unclouded heaven, but her eyes were grey as the starlit evening. Her mantle was sewn with golden flowers, but her hair was dark as the shadows of twilight. This day and night theme is covered twice in one sentence, and I really do think this language is a very intentional indication from Tolkien that Luthien is a child of two worlds. She is half elf, half Maya, and she is doomed to fall in love with a mortal and to bring these two very different worlds together. I don't want to get into spoilers right now, but at the end of the story, she very literally does walk in both worlds. The golden sun of day is intimately bound to the race of men, after all the sun rose with their awakening, and the stars of night are intimately bound to the elves. The great constellations were first kindled at the time of their awakening. And so, the fact that Luthien exhibits both day and night both the Lark and the Nightingale is, I think, a very significant part of her characterization. But anyway, as Beren watches Luthien sing, she suddenly vanishes from his sight, and he becomes dumb as one that is bound under a spell. And there's a really cool detail here that's quite easy to miss on the first read-through, because when Beren first encounters Luthien, he is wandering in the summer woods. But after calling her Tinuviel in his heart, we are told that a chain was upon his limbs, and he watched her from afar as leaves in the winds of autumn, and in winter as a star upon a hill. And then we immediately jump to a dawn on the eve of spring, where we are told that the song of Luthien released the bonds of winter, and the frozen waters spoke and the flower sprang from the cold earth where her feet had passed." So not only is it implied that Luthien has some kind of power over the bonds of winter, it all but states that Beren spent almost a year under this enchantment. After the trauma of his journey into Doriath, he spends summer to spring just watching Luthien dance, hearing her song, and falling deeply in love with her. Which, again, shares a very striking resemblance to the enchantment that fell on Thingol when he first met Melian. And it is only when spring comes again that the spell of silence fell from Beren. He utters his first word to Luthien, and that word is Tinuviel. Nightingale. The woods echo the name, and Luthien finally halts in wonder, and she beholds Beren. Who, I will remind you, looks as wild and wary as a beast at this moment, but despite that, Luthien lets Beren come to her, and as she looked on him, doom fell upon her, and she loved him. And that's it. The doom of love has fallen upon them both, and there is now no going back. Beren and Luthien will be bound together for the rest of their time in Middle-earth. But I guess Luthien is a bit too classy to rush things, so before the breaking of day, she slipped from his arms and vanished from his sight. Beren lay upon the ground as one slain at once by bliss and grief, and when he awoke, his heart was barren and forsaken. But beyond his hope, Luthien does return, and from spring to summer they went together in secret through the woods where Luthien was born. And we are told that no others of the children of Iluvatar have ever had joy so great as Beren and Luthien did during these short months. But a year after Beren first came into Doriath, trouble does eventually find them. And this brings us to a brand new character, or actually not a brand new character, I did very briefly mention him when I talked about Finigolfin's feast of reuniting, the Mereth Adathad, but it is at this point in the story that this character becomes an important player, and the guy's name is Diaron. Now, Diaron is a pretty cool individual. He is a Cinderin elf of Doriath, 
but he's also the chief lawmaster, a famous minstrel, and a very skilled linguist. He invented the Kirth runes used by the dwarves, which are known in Sindarin as Kerathas Diaron. He made the music for the dance and song of Luthien, and we're even told that he became the greatest of all the minstrels of the elves east of the sea, named even before Maglor, the son of Feanor. So, Dairon really is like the best singer and the best musician out of all the elves in Middle-earth. Huge claim to fame. Now, in the earliest version of this story, the tale of Tinuviel, Dairon is actually Luthien's brother. However, this is definitely not the case in later versions. In the Silmarillion, Dairon is in love with Luthien, and not in like a brotherly way, he wants to marry her. So, when Diaron is out in the wood and he espies Luthien laying her hand in Berens, he is not happy about it. And Diaron is another character who gets a lot of hate, but if we look at things from his perspective, I think we can at least sort of see his point of view. Beren is a mortal, he isn't even supposed to be able to pass through the Girdle of Melian, and remember when men first appeared in Beleriand, Elu Thingol himself made a decree that none were welcome within the borders of Doriath. So, Diaron is not unjustified in being bitter about this. Anyway, eventually, Diaron betrayed them to Thingol, and the king was filled with anger for Luthien he loved above all things. And so, Thingol summoned his daughter to him, and he spoke to her in grief and amazement about this guy that she's been seeing in secret. However, Luthien, probably recognising that her father is not the most reasonable elf in Beleriand, refuses to tell him anything until he swears an oath that Beren would be neither slain nor imprisoned if he came before the king. Now, Thingol does swear this oath, but I'm not really sure how seriously he takes it, because the very next thing he does is to send his servant to lay hands on Beren and bring him to Menegroth as a malefactor. But this is a moment where I want to look briefly at Tolkien's epic poem, The Lay of Lathian. Because in this version of events, Diaron comes back into the story, and he comes across a lot more sympathetically in the Lay than he does in the Silmarillion. We've already been told that he was heartbroken, and he told Eluthingol all that he saw in the woods, but when he and Luthien are being questioned about Beren, Tolkien writes this. And so Thingol is speaking to Dairon in this scene. Thingol says, Who is he that earns my wrath? How walks he free within my woods amid my folk, a stranger to both beech and oak? But Dairon looked on Luthien's face and faltered, seeing his disgrace in those clear eyes, he spoke no more and silent Thingol's anger bore. So, in this older version, Dairon doesn't actively betray Luthien, and it is for her sake that he takes the brunt of Thingol's anger. And I bring this up because throughout the story of Beren and Luthien, there are a number of elves that do come across as absolute dicks, but I don't think Dairon is one of them. Anyway, after Beren is captured by Thingol's servants, he is brought to Menegroth, but Luthien leads him before the throne as if he were an honoured guest. And so we come to the first interaction between Beren and his future parents-in-law, Elu Thingol and Melian the Meyer. And I think it's interesting that throughout this exchange, Thingol is pretty angry and emotional, but Melian is completely silent at least at first. So, the first words that Thingol ever says to Beren are already pretty insulting. He says, Who are you that come hither as a thief and unbidden dare approach my throne? But to this, Beren does not reply. We are told that he is filled with dread at the splendour of Menegroth and the majesty of Thingol, so instead Luthien answers the king on his behalf. She says to Thingol, he is Beren, son of Barahir, lord of men, mighty foe of Morgoth, the tale of whose deeds is become song even among the elves. 
But Thingol doesn't really appreciate this, so he basically says to Baron, give me a reason I shouldn't kill you just for being here. And so Baron looks into the eyes of Luthien and then at the face of Melian and then words were put into his mouth. Which is another great example of this really important theme that Beren's being in Doriath is part of a much larger plan. And the absolute greatest power in existence is using this mortal man, this lord of nothing, as an agent of that plan. The story of Beren and Luthien is so much bigger than either Beren or Luthien. Anyway, the words that are put into Beren's mouth are, My fate, O king, led me hither through perils such as few even of the elves would dare. And here I have found what I sought not indeed, for it is above all gold and silver and beyond all jewels. Neither rock nor steel nor the fires of Morgoth shall keep from me the treasure that I desire. For Luthien, your daughter, is the fairest of all the children of the world. Now, I guess to a modern reader, both Beren and Thingol are acting a little uh, patriarchal in this moment. They're kind of treating Luthien a bit like property. But I will remind you that this story was first put to pen over a hundred years ago, so there's not really much to be gained by applying 21st century values to it. And although Beren does talk about Luthien in this moment as a treasure that I desire, we will see many, many times throughout the story that Luthien is not just a prize to Beren. She is someone that he loves immensely, as much as Tolkien loved his own wife. Although, I will say that Thingol does come across as very patriarchal in the story, and it strikes me as a particularly negative sort of patriarchal relation for a father to have with his daughter. Like, Thingol definitely loves Luthien, but his love is a lot more possessive than Beren's. In some ways, I think Thingol loves Luthien a bit like how Feanor loved his Silmarils jealously. And I will say that perhaps more so than any other elf, Thingol is a very morally grey character. He certainly isn't a straight-up villain, and I don't want to over-compare him to Feanor because they are very different. And in some stories of the First Age, Thingol comes across wonderfully, and he's an incredibly likeable and positive guy. But in other stories, he is haughty and cold and honestly a bit of a jerk. So if you are a massive Thingol fan, then rest assured I will rehabilitate his image in future videos. But during the tale of Beren and Luthien, this is not Thingol's finest moment. You see, after Beren says what he says, Everyone is just kind of silent for a moment, and we're told that they're all kind of thinking, all right, well, that's it, Beren's just gone and got himself killed. In fact, Thingol is the first to break the silence, and he does so by saying, death you have earned with these words, and death you should find suddenly, had I not sworn an oath in haste, of which I repent, base-born mortal. But to this, Beren replies with a really awesome comeback. He says to Thingol, Death you can give me earned or unearned, but the name I will not take from you of Baseborn. My house has not earned such names from any elf, be he king or no. And then Beren holds up his father's ring, the ring of Barahir that was given as a token of abiding friendship between his house and Lord Finrod Felagund. And of course, Finrod Felagund is well known to Thingol. Not only is he one of the very few Noldor that Thingol has a positive opinion of, he is also Thingol's great nephew. Remember, Finrod's mother, Eärowen, is the daughter of Thingol's brother. So this ring must surely mean something to Thingol, and you'd think it would make Thingol more trusting of Beren. But it doesn't. However, after Beren's comeback, the next person to speak is actually Melian although she does so privately by whispering into Thingol's ear. She says, Not by you shall Beren be slain, and far and free does his fate lead him in the end, yet it is wound with yours. Take heed. 
now. This is incredibly important. Everything Melian says is incredibly important, but if there is one constant of Thingol's character, it is that he almost never listens to his wife, which gets him in a lot of trouble over the course of the First Age. And it's just crazy to me, if your wife is a literal angel, you should probably listen to her. I think the moral of Thingol's whole story is listen to your damn wife. Anyway, Thingol doesn't listen, and instead he comes up with a cunning plan to get Beren killed without breaking his oath to Luthien. So Thingol says to Beren, I too desire a treasure that is withheld for rock and steel and the fires of Morgoth keep the jewel that I would possess. Yet I hear you say that bonds such as these do not daunt you. Go your way, therefore. Bring to me in your hand a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. And then, if she will, Luthien may set her hand in yours. Now, I have absolutely no doubt that Thingol intended this quest to be an impossible one, that Beren would most likely not even attempt, and even if he did, he would surely die in the process. I mean, how can one man sneak into the fortress of Angband, past the Balrogs and the swarms of orcs, get close enough to Morgoth to take a Silmaril from his crown, and then escape with his life? Especially considering that all the lords of the Noldor have so far failed at even getting close to a Silmaril. Well, that is the question that Beren needs to answer. And he does answer it by laughing. He says to Thingol, For little price do elven kings sell their daughters. But if this be your will, Thingol, I will perform it. And when we meet again, my hand shall hold a Silmaril from the Iron Crown. For you have not looked the last upon Beren, son of Barahir. Which I get goosebumps reading, but this is a huge deal. And not just because it gets the rest of the story off and running, this quest is going to change everything. But not necessarily for the better. After Beren accepts the quest, he bows and he bids farewell to Luthien and he departs Menegroth alone. And when he's gone, Melian has a very important chat with her husband. And what she does is call him out on what he's just done. She basically says there are now only two ways that this can play out. And both of them are really bad for you. Either Beren will fail in the quest and die, in which case you have doomed our daughter to an eternity of woe, or he won't fail, in which case you'll be stuck with a Silmaril, and Doriath will be drawn within the fate of a mightier realm. And so what Melian basically means by this takes us all the way back to this video where I talked about the doom of Mandos. If you recall, Mandos, that's the doomsman of the Valar, the pronouncer of judgment and fate, he pronounced a curse upon the Noldor when they first left Valinor to try and reclaim the Silmarils. And here are a few of the most iconic lines from that prophecy. Tears unnumbered ye shall shed, to evil end shall all things turn that they begin well, and by treason of kin unto kin shall this come to pass. For blood ye shall render blood, and beyond a man ye shall dwell in death's shadow. Now, this doom was initially very specific to the Noldor, and so Thingol and his Sindarin people would have been free of it. Except that now Thingol has involved himself in the fate of the Silmarils, and so he has brought the doom of Mandos not only upon himself, but upon Doriath and all of his people. And they could have been spared. Obviously, they were never going to be spared a war with Morgoth, but Morgoth's return had nothing to do with the Cinder. It wasn't their fault, and they were in no way accountable. But as soon as a Silmaril becomes involved, they are accountable. They are part of its doom. And that doom will dictate the entire future of Doriath. 
So just to end this video on a note of foreboding, we are told that after Beren departed, a brooding silence fell upon the kingdom of Thingol. The shadows lengthened, and we're even told that from this moment on, Luthien never again sang within the realm of Doria. So in the next video, I will continue the story and I'll explore the first stage of this quest of the Silmaril. So to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit like and leave a comment on this video if you want to. But as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.